Hi, I'm Charlie with Fringe Drift Inn. Welcome to episode two. Today we're going to talk about planning your homestead on Fringe Drift Inn. For old fashioned recipes and your garden and need a while sipping on Kentucky bourbon. Sit right back in your big red hat. We're taking the world back from the urban. Listen to the stories with Kentucky proud. Share the giggles with all of your friends. We all tuned in. To friends creating. Hey, welcome to episode two of Friends Drift In, Growing a Good Life in Appalachia. I'm Joyce. I'm Charlie. And we're here to have some fun. Today we're going to talk about the influx of people wanting to homestead in the Appalachian region. Um, if you've never thought about Appalachia, uh, Appalachia reaches all the way from the mountains of New York all the way and spills to the foothills of Georgia. So there's a lot of territory between there and the regions of Appalachia are vastly different. What flies in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania doesn't fly in Pikeville, Kentucky. And what goes on in Georgia certainly is not what goes on in New York. You know, we talk about homesteading. I think the first thing you need to do is get the big picture of what you want your homestead to be. I mean, do you want it to be a hobby farm? Do you want to be a serious homesteader and raise everything and grow everything on your homestead? First, you need to find out what your big picture is, don't you, Joyce? I think so. I think you can't just say, oh, I'm going to homestead and not have a plan. I mean, we, we laugh because I'm the planner. Charlie is the, hey, I'm just going to do it. But I'm the planner. You know, I've got all the notebooks and, and writing stuff down and doing the research and saying, oh, we need to do this, we need to do that. And, you know, and I, I spring it off of him. But if you don't, we, we were counseled a lot. We've been blessed to have a lot of mentors yes. that have helped us along the way, even though that we, we are, a, we're country folks and we're farmers. There are things that we don't know and we're always learning, even with a background in agriculture and a background in business. We've made mistakes along the way and, and we've had some successes. But one of the things that, that uh, we were so proud of is that we had worked and worked and worked for many years to get to our plan. You know, you've got to have this business plan. You've got to have your plan A, plan B, plan C. Well, I don't know what happened, but 2020 <laughs> looked like plan D. <laughs> <laughs> or even plan A if it's at, at that point. But, you know, when we're talking about a homestead, first thing you need to do is acquire some skills, I think. I think it's hugely important. And YouTube, while YouTube and Internet are great helps, I think you need to actually go and visit a homestead and learn firsthand some things. You know, hang out with people that are doing it. I mean, again, you know, there's lots of YouTubers on there, you know. Um, Freedom Farm, shout out to you all down there in, uh, down in the western end of Kentucky. You know, they're a, they're a great, great resource. Uh, but there's many books that are great resources. But seeing it on TV, seeing it on YouTube, ain't the same as when you're out there in the field up to your knees in mud because that there's been a flood or you know it's 100 degrees outside and you've got your chickens too tight in the coop and you're trying to get them cooled off it that's the stuff they aren't gonna tell you yeah you know, and those are the things that you learn through practical experience which is why i think it's really good to go out and visit a homesteader and, and talk to them and get an idea of what the the things they faced. And I think that we're assuming that a lot of the people that are coming in and saying, oh, I want a homestead, have absolutely no experience. And that, that scares us because it can be very daunting. It is, I mean, it's a huge problem. You know, you know it really, you know, then you get a little think about where are you going to homestead? What, what do you want? Do you want you know, you've got growing conditions in South Carolina where you're growing, you know, nine months out of the year without any high tunnels, yeah. without any, you know, or, you know, are you going to locate in the north and you're going to have to have high tunnels and the 
heat your livestock and how is that going to affect your water? How is that going to run if you've got cold all the time? I mean, there's, you know, what is your climate? You know, what, what do you think your climate is? And once you kind of figure that out, then you have to figure out, okay, well, I, you know, I think I want to be in, in this type and this is what I'm thinking. And trying to find the land, you know, you're going to have to look at a lot of different factors just looking at the land. We've been, we've been doing this for a long time as far as farming. And the number one thing you need to find when you go to a property, water. Water. Potable water. You know, it's great to have the city water or municipal water coming in, but that's expensive. You want to have a good, you want a good well, a good spring, just some source of water. Because you got to remember, it's not only water for you. It's water for your garden. If you have a high tunnel, everything in there has to be watered. If you have animals, they have to be watered. And you got to make sure that you've got a sufficient supply of water for all those uh, different uses. And so if you're thinking about, well, all right, there's a well on the property. Well, is that well good water? Is that, you know, has it been tested? Does it have heavy metals? Is it a well that is likely to go dry in the summer? Um, what are the, where you're living? I mean, you know, now municipalities, sometimes they say, hey, you can't catch water. And of course, you know, we catch water for our high tunnel. And, you know, that's, that's part of the, the logistics of, of trying to be sufficient is that we catch rainwater to, to use in the high tunnel. And, and then we have plan B, you know, if, if there hasn't been enough rain, then hey, we can use a municipal water for, you know, a secondary source. Our plan C, you know, we've got a well we can use off the well. But these things you have to consider and you have to look at if you're using municipal water. You know, you probably want to go down to the water board and you want to look and see how their ratings are and, and you know, if they're doing well. Because, of course, only, well, we do a commercial production of our jams and jellies. Um, you know, we want to make sure that when we're doing commercial jams that, are, that the water is water, good water, yeah. that we're selling to people that we're not going to make them sick. And naturally, when we're canning for ourselves or, or feeding Animal. our animals, we want that water to be safe. Absolutely. No, that's one of the things. But again, the, and it's one of the major things to, to, to life is water. So you always got to think about that. And you think about, you know, if you're doing livestock... Water and livestock is a nightmare in winter. I know you got to get out there. You you know if you've got feeding tanks, you've got to get out there and crack the ice for your cattle. Or you've got to have um, heating elements to keep the water flowing for your chickens. Um, and of course, the other upside of water is where you locate your land, and if you're in the flood plain, which we clearly are. Yeah, our home obviously is not in the floodplain, but our crop, our crop land is all in, in the floodplain. And actually, we had a big loss about 10 years ago on our home, at, our, at our home set. We had the big flood came, and it, uh, fancy word for hydraulics, it sucked the sand out from under the uh, base. And we, couldn't get to, we could not drive a vehicle to our house for like six months because the entire road went off the side of the mountain. Just collapsed. It was just like the sand was washed out underneath it, and the road set down about three foot. More than that. Not no. a lot. It yeah. set down a lot, and so we could literally we could drive to about fifty yards to our driveway yeah. one way, but then we couldn't we couldn't get to the driveway. So literally we had to go Climb all the way around the, the other way, yeah. and um, about a 10, 15 mile out of our way just to get to the house. And so you need to know about the floodplain. You know, you need to ask these questions. Am I in a floodplain? How often does it flood? What is the flow? Certainly at our farm, used to be that we worried about the, the water coming up from the creek. Um, then they built this fancy four-lane highway, and now the water seems to rush, you know, which, which engineers got the what you know got the highway clear but now the water rushes off the highway and it seems like that the water that gets our property is coming from a totally different direction and not from the creek 
So, so well, I guess what we're saying, you need to learn the climate that you're going to be in if you're not already familiar with it. The, the water, the rain, the cold versus the heat. And you know, the heat can be just as bad as the cold, especially if you have animals, because then you've got to worry about how to cool them down. You know, and we've been, we've, we've raised animals. I grew up raising cattle, pigs, horses, and Joyce and I together have raised ducks, turkeys, uh, chickens. chickens. So we've done all that, and we, we, have, we have a good idea of what it takes to do those. You know, those are the things you gotta worry about to start with. Now, the next thing it is, water I think is very first and foremost, then you gotta think about shelter. Does the farm or the property you're buying have a shelter, a house, or something on it? A barn. Barn yeah. for your animals and those kind of things. And then the second thing is, if it doesn't have one on it, what kind of skills do you have to make your own? You know, are you going to build? Are you going to have a contractor? Are you going to wait? We have a friend, um, Jean Martin Fortier, who is known as the market gardener. And, you know, when he, he talks about his um, experiences as a young man, and he lived on the, he lived on the farm in a yurt. That ain't us. My, no, I, no. my idea of, of roughing it is being in a hotel without a clicker. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that's the thing you got. And you got you got to stand which comfort level that you want to do. And and again, your skill sets you've got to really think about that because if you move to a homestead and, and you've got you've got a, a home, most of the time you move into a homestead, you're going to find a house that's probably not always in the best repair. Can you do those repairs yourselves, or are you going to have to pay someone to do it? And that will also change the amount of money that you'll have to invest in this homestead to start over again. But those are things that you maybe not always think of going in. And again, like you said, if you're going to do animals, you got to think about shelter for them. Are there already buildings and things in place or something that can be repurposed? Like, you know, we, we run, we're, the farmstead that we have, we built our own house and we built our high tunnel on, on the one section, but where the farm is, where we actually do our farming, a lot of those buildings were already there. We have yeah, portable buildings. You yeah, know, we, we bought portable, portable buildings, buildings as just, well. Just, elevated them up to keep them out of the, the flood. And that's what we put the chickens in. That's what we store equipment in. Um, you know, you just have to kind of think this out and, and putting, you know, the placements of as you build your homestead and, you know, oh, well, I'm gonna throw a chicken house over here and I'm gonna put the garden over here. That don't work. You know, you make more work for yourself than um, you can possibly imagine. Um, our friend from Claybottom Farm, uh, Ben Hartman, if you don't know Ben, you know, Ben has a book called The Lean Farmer, and, and his whole idea is utilizing, uh, so let's say you have a high tunnel. Rather than having tools down at one part of the farm that you got to go get to work in the high tunnel, he says, Organize your tools that you're going to use in the high tunnel and leave them there. Then if you've got tools, the same tools, you know, you, redundancy. But if you're working in the farm, then you have other ones down on the farm. So you're not always running back and forth looking for tools. You know, you, you kind of have to think things through. And you think, okay, well, you know, I'm going to grow four acres of beans. Which is a great idea. Great idea, but it's hard. And you wait, know, it's and hard. And you got to think about it too. This is things that happened to us when we first started. You got to think about what you're going to do with them after you grow them. Now, if you're growing for yourself is one thing, but if you're growing for market, you got to be able to find out how you're going to distribute Timing. those. You're going to have to, you know, how much can you sell to who? You know, if you grow, if you plant four acres all at once, then you're overwhelmed if it's just the two of you trying to plant, you know. So you have to, you have to plan, 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 plan. I mean, one of the things that um, that we do well is doing a good mix. You know, we, we know that every year we need to take our soil sample. If you, you know, the, one of the second things, if, if water is the most important thing when you're looking for, soil is the next thing. So if you're going to lay out good money to start a homestead and you don't know what kind of soil is on that homestead, well, you're foolish. I think and it's really simple. Most areas, I know in Kentucky, we have the uh, Cooperative Extension Service. And I know it's throughout the nation. In Kentucky, they'll do like two or three soil samples a year for you for free, at least in our area. But go contact those folks. They will be able to help you figure out how to 
uh, find what kind of soil quality you got and what you would have to do to make it usable. Make it usable because, I mean, for us, one of the things that, and I knew better, but I mean, you know, we had just farmed for so long and you just kind of take things for granted, but we had an awful time with Swiss chard and beets. Just awful. And couldn't figure out why they wouldn't grow, why they wouldn't grow. Swiss chard and beets are, of course, in the same family. And as we did a soil sample, we found out that um, we had a micronutrient problem, a little borax. We needed a little borax. We needed a little of this. We needed a little of that. And that's what the soil sample tells you. And so you got, you know, we know that we need this micronutrient. We add that. You know, we add organic material to keep, to keep it, you know, with organic material, not only the richness, richness of the soil, but the texture of the soil. So that is with a sandy soil, you know, a lot of the water will drain off pretty quick. And so, you know, we want it to hold some of that water because we want to, we want our uh, plants to be right. healthy. Yes. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of different things that you can do. I mean, you soil, unless it's really bad, it can be amended with organic or non-organic, however you, however you choose to do in order to do that. But there's also like organic material, you know, like if you want to use manure, you got to really understand how to use that because most of the time I think it's uh, must sit for at least six months, if I remember right. Right, yeah. You know, Preferably there, a, there's, a year. There's all of these, um, if you're selling, if you're using manure to make your garden fertile and you're going to sell those, there's, there's a lot of rules that the USDA likes to impose upon you and you have to prove that you know this soil this manure has set so many days at this spot and, and that it's cured out before you put it in there and likewise uh they they will co be concerned with manure contaminating your products so how do you apply that that it's not splashing up on the onto the leaves and 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 uh contaminating and likewise you know one of the things that we laughed about when we took a class on gap which is good agriculture practices um you worry about the the predators and the the varmints you know i i call deer varmints i'm sorry they're rats on hooves but you know if the deer comes through and eats you know, if they if they eat one of your melons, then you need to mark that area off, and you're not supposed to use that area for any more. If you have them that come in and and they decide that, well, they they have had enough, they can't eat anymore until they relieve themselves, and you find a pile of that on your you know in your garden, you're supposed to separate you know eight to twelve foot and and put little flags out and say nothing, nothing from this area. Now that's the way it is for a commercial producer. But you need to think about, all right, how am I gonna be able to cope with these? You know, how am I gonna be able to roll with this? And you're not gonna know everything as, as a first year homesteader or a beginning homesteader. There's gonna be things that are gonna just blow your mind that you never even thought of. And I mean, we've been doing this for probably 20 years now, 20 years, and, and there's still, you things that things will that, boggle yeah, your mind that come up yeah. one of the things that we deal with is johnson grass so if you're looking at a homestead and you have johnson grass and let me tell you johnson grass is the, the spawn of satan um you know johnson grass is hard to get rid of now you're gonna make a choice do you want to be an organic sustainable farmer or do you want that crap to go you know Extension people would say the, the wise thing to do would be to spray it down with some kind of a weed killer. A weed killer. Burn it down and then start fresh. But Johnson grass is very, 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 <laughs> very tenacious. There's, there's two things that you can't get rid of, I don't think, ever. Johnson grass and kudzu. And they're, they're both just so virulent. Johnson grass grows by seed and, and, rhizomes. By, and rhizomes. So if you grow, most people think you've got something by seed. Well, if you, if you plow it under before it goes to seed, you're good. Well, all you're doing when you do that with the Johnson grass is you're stirring up the rhizomes and making them it, up and working making it, it up. More. So, and it, and Johnson grass, you need to be able to identify it and you need to think, oh, well, okay, if I've got Johnson grass, how am I going to overcome it? Well, you're going to lay down, you know, are you are you prepared to lay down plastic or some kind of mulch that, you know, a cloth type mulch that will do that? 
That's a great idea. We've done that, been there, done that. We did that with the onions one year and not only did the onions come up where we punched the little holes ever so close perfectly for our onions and our garlic. Well, the onions and the garlic came up, but so did the Johnson grass. So this is a continuing battle it for is. us. And I mean, when you talk about analyzing your, your land, you know, that's something you need to look at. What's it going to take to get it to a point where it is arable, where it is tillable, where, you, you know, you can use it? Well, you know, we talk, and we talk about predators. To us, that the weeds and the grass and stuff, they're predators to our plants. But also, you got to think about all the natural wildlife predators. Because if you're moving into homes, then you're moving into the country. And what you may not think of as predators really are, like deer, Huge predator if you're farming. One of one of our biggest losses one year, we had these beautiful uh, rattlesnake beans, pole beans on the trellises, and they were hanging in big bunches. And I said, you know, I called Charlie. He was at the office. And I called Charlie, and I said, oh, I was going to pick these, but I think if I wait one more day, they're going to be a little fuller. In Appalachia, we don't like beans that aren't full. We like them bumpy. We don't like these little slick blue lake skinny pencil that's not that's us right. yeah. that's not us so i said I, you know i think if i give them one more day they'll be bump you know they'll be bumpy you know they'll be fresher for market uh cause we were selling at the farmer's market that year we expected probably with what i had in the field we should have turned about 1500 to 2000 dollars. let them set one night and then one night the deer ate them all 10 rows <laughs> It was not a good day on the homestead. And you know, and if you're going to raise animals, you got to think about that, like chickens. Chickens are great. Everybody ought to have chickens, and they ought to have because fresh eggs and fresh meat, all, you get a lot out of a chicken. But predators are a huge problem for chickens. So when you're planting your chicken coop, you have to think about not just, you know, all right, you got the fence this way just to get you know, the basic, your dogs and, and that type of thing. But you need to bury fence because you got rats that are drawn to the chicken feed. Yeah. Chicken feed. We had mink, mink, which is a type of weasel. You know, we've had yeah. foxes. Foxes, they'll you know, dig. They and they will dig. bury under, so you have to have, and then, then you gotta look at, you gotta look to the sky. And what do we get with that? You get hawks, you get owls, you get all kinds of uh, airborne predators coming in too. So we called ours Fort Cluck. <laughs> we, had, we, had, we had a building that had a concrete base to it, had a, a block base around it. So that was pretty safe on that. And we put down a floor. Well, if you don't put down like a wire base, some kind of metal base under that we floor. We call it rat wire. Yeah, we do, it's, I think it's cardboard cloth is what the technical term for <laughs> rat it is. Rat wire. <laughs> but, if, but, but speaking of rats, if you don't do, the, if you don't do that under the floor, They'd they chew through the floor, the floor and get into your chicken feed. And not only, you, you know, you spread disease. You spread disease, but if they crawl through the floor and, you know, they make a hole and you don't see it, you know, you're liable to put your foot through it. And not fun. Mm -hmm. Not fun at all. You know, and again, you've got to bury something underneath the ground because, and, and you want to kind of angle it out because you got all the digging animals, the groundhogs, the raccoons. Raccoons are very bad on chickens because they like to just reach through the fence and just grab them and pull them out and just eat the heads. That's really strange, but it's what happens. So you have to take that hardware cloth and you got to come up about three feet high around the bottom, also all the way around the outside of your coop bury some of it in the ground. So, I mean, you know, that's the thing you got to think about. We had a hundred, we had a hundred chickens, 50 ducks and 20 turkeys. So we had a lot invested in, in loading it up for that was for our farmer's market uh, egg business. And it was, it was really good. We enjoyed it. But again, the predators, and we tried doing some of the uh, uh, chicken tractors and that's tough too because you really need to put a floor in those a wire because if you don't they'll stick right another we had them kill five chickens in one night yeah we we, we haven't had good luck with chicken flyer chicken tractors but we know Joe joe salem you know is a proponent of that and we know people that have had it work for them but for us where we're not on we're not there with the chickens 24 7 um you know we can't watch them we, we did not have a you know dogs or anything that would would ward these off, you know, this is a thing. 
And that's something you need to think about too. If you're going to have a lot of animals, you can get really good livestock dogs that if like the Great Pyrenees are one of the, our favorites that we're thinking about getting. If you raise those up with that particular animal, they are a very good protection for those animals. We have a friend up in Bath County that, that keeps Pyrenees with his sheep. Sheep, yes. And uh, they do a tremendous job. And they do, it's they, great. They, they, they are very territorial and very protective. Um, but there's a lot that goes into homesteading. So before you pull the trigger and you're down here saying, oh, this is what I'm gonna do, you need to get on somebody's place Kind of walk it, see what they're doing. Think about water. All right, water to water for irrigation, water to feed your animals, water just for sustainable. You know, you're sustaining your own self. You're you're drinking water. You wash water. You need to think about if you're going to be a market gardener, is this water going to be able that you can set up a wash stand where you wash triple, you know, wash it once to get the dirt off, rinse it, and wash it once to sanitize it, you know. And if you, you know, it, and when you're working in the field, you still need that water for your your produce just yep. to hot, what they call hydro cool it because your beans are going to wilt if you pick too many of them and don't get them cooled off. And running that water over them helps. So water, really important. Understanding the lay of the land and the, the, the texture of the soil. Um, understanding how to build the soil and not deplete it understanding infrastructure you know what do you need what are you what is your plan you know what is and after you figure out your plan you need to talk to other people and see if it's doable you know make friends in the community and that's not always easy especially no. in Appalachia you know people are very very cautious of who they allow in their circle. Um, so, you know, it takes some time, but with a little, uh, with a lot of ingenuity and a lot of stick to itness, and knowing yourself, knowing what you can tolerate, you know, can you tolerate living in a yurt for a year? Not me. You know, can you live in a house that is not completely finished and just have you know, one room, you know, your bedroom and your kitchen ready to go and everything else in total disarray for a while. You know, what is your tolerance level for pain? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great life. We, we enjoy what we do. You know, we've been blessed to be able to have a, have a nice home and, but we still work in the fields and we still do a lot of, a lot of the canning and the preserving stuff that we do and we enjoy it. And, you know, we were blessed to have grandparents that grew up in hard times and taught us all these things. Right. So if you're starting from scratch, find you some mentors, you know, talk to the local extension agents wherever you're thinking of relocating. Uh, check out the farmer's markets, you know, get around in the community, go visit some churches, you know, try to find out where, you know, around here all the old men hang out at the hardware store, you know. There's some country stores, you know, where they serve up a bologna sandwich and a, and a cola that you can just kind of hang out in. And if you hang, if, if you show yourself to be friendly, people may be cautious, but down deep, they're willing to help you. They are. You know, most they're country people, country people are, are, once you become one of them, they'll do anything for you. You know, so we hope that you... Press that button and subscribe to our channel. We're getting ready to announce when we're going to be doing this on what day we're going to be doing this. We'll be doing a Monday chat with Charlie and Joyce with Friends Drift In. Every breakfast you know, day, we're going to be talking about our, our jams and our jellies. You know, our Friends Drift In brand with jams and jellies. We're going to be talking about what's going on in the homestead, what's going on in Appalachia, what's going on with how we're preparing not for the world to end but just being prepared take care of ourselves and be self-sustaining um we like growing a good life in Appalachia we do. It, 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 there's days when it doesn't seem that way and then there's days when we're on top of the world remember check out our website for our jams and jellies at www.friendsdriftinin.com we'll catch you next week Friends Drift In, signing out. Uh -uh.